Yeah. Real quick, I want to talk about uh, a couple of oddball things in welding. I'm going to wind down here in just a minute. I'll, let, I'll answer some more questions. But a couple of things people don't usually realize. An assembly torch, this is a cutting torch. This is a 180 degree head with a gouge tip on it. But the way an acetylene torch works is we're going to combine acetylene and oxygen to create a flame that's hot enough to melt steel. So we're going to get it up to that 1600 to 1800 degrees. We're going to approach 2000 degrees very quickly to melt the steel, to turn it into a pump. Then this little lever here is going to direct this blast of pure oxygen into the pump. And what most people mistakenly think is we're going to heat the, water, the metal to a liquid and then the blast of oxygen just blows it out of the way. That is completely wrong. The way an acetylene torch works is we're going to heat the, the steel up no, no, to its melting point. Then we're going to set it on fire with a pure stream of oxygen and we're going to oxidize it. Does everybody know what oxidizing steel is? No. Yes, Joey? Causing it to rust. Rust at a very, very <laughs> high rate of speed. All fires are oxidation. Right? Whether it's your car rusting because the spot has bare metal, just set that steel on fire. It's oxidizing. Or whether I set off dynamite over here, all we're doing is oxidizing the black powder. Okay? One is really slow, one is really fast. Both o oxidation. That's how this works. We're going to oxidize the steel. We're going to set it on fire. Not today. <laughs> we will do it. In fact, one of the things we'll do one of these days is we'll put Joey on the para burner and set some feed sacks on fire and I'll let you put them out with a fire extinguisher. How's that? <laughs> that sounds fun. Really? All right. Yeah. That sounds really fun. Okay. This is a carbon arc torch. This is what I was talking about earlier. You hook this up to an arc welder. You put this carbon rod in here and you strike an arc just like you're trying to weld. Right? But you also have to connect it up to a air compressor. The way this works is I'm going to use the arc to liquefy the steel. Then I'm going to use a blast of air to blow it out of the way. This will cut anything that will conduct electricity. It won't be pretty, but it'll cut it. So I can cut cast iron with this. I cannot cut cast iron with this. I can make a mess of aluminum with this. I can make a mess with aluminum with this. Different mess though. I can cut a hole in a piece of stainless steel with this. I can't do it with this. Which one's better to make a mess? This one. <laughs> I want that one. You want that one? Right. And then there's plasma cutters. I do not have a plasma cutter, but I will catch on them a little bit. What a plasma cutter does is kind of like an arc welder, except at a very high temperature. You're going to create a very large arc, several hundred amps, depending on whether we're cutting sheet metal or whether we're trying to blow a hole in a two-inch plate. Right? <coughs> what a plasma cutter does is it uses a combination of the arc and then it injects a stream of clean, dry air. Keywords, clean, dry air into the stream. And then the way it directs the, op, the air into there in kind of a swirling pattern causes a chemical reaction to create a plasma gas. So I can create much higher temperature than I could with the arc alone. Then it uses a stream of air to blow the liquid metal out of the way in a much more controlled pattern than this will. So again, a plasma cutter will cut anything that will conduct electricity. It's what's used to cut things like aluminum from your toolboxes or copper sheeting, stuff like that. All right? Everybody understand that? I know that's a lot to take in. Okay? Sebastian, do you have a question for today? Uh, no. I'll come back to you. I'll come back to Ash, too. You have one? No? Yes. There will be something free every time, I promise. All right? No, you can't take all of it. We've got to save some for next time. Does anybody have any questions? Seriously. Any questions at all? Yes, ma'am. What were you guys doing? What were you doing at your barn, your own house, and then like here, and then like the carpet area? What do you mean by 
Locations. The locations. That's the different locations. We meet 4-H shooting sports meets in this room. When we do classroom stuff, we normally use this room because normally we have these really cool television sets that were working the other day when connected to this computer, but chose today not to work, which I apologize for. All right? Okay. The regular Georgetown 4-H meeting is over at the old Road and Bridge building for as long as we continue to get to use that building. But neither place will allow us to weld. I can't weld or cut or anything like that there. So that kind of stuff, we're going to do at my house. I'm still trying to figure out the latter part of the class. I'll get back to you. Yes, ma'am. Um, you were saying you have school smoking the injuries. Yes. Could you like No. There's a misnomer that people say, well, it's better than nothing at all, and actually it isn't. Because putting the bandana over your face may promote you to say, well, I'm not going to worry about that little bit of smoke that just got in, or I'm not going to worry about that I've, I, I can't get my head out of the cloud. I, I'm going to ignore that. Rather than moving my head back over here, I'm going to get right up in this cloud. Because I've got a bandana. And actually, that can be more dangerous than not wearing it. One of the ones that gets people all the time is when it comes to paint tubes. Because they think, well, the paper mask is better than nothing. And no, it's not. Because you're more likely to stand there and not realize how much paint tubes you're actually inhaling. Yes? Do you have an annual type? We have three dogs, we have four cats, we have two rodeo horses, and about 50 chickens. Anybody that has horse stuff, Joey's the man to talk to. Okay. I'm going to touch on the cutting. One of the problems with the cutting is without the boots, you know, of all the things that are going to put sparks in your shoes, the cutting torch is going to put sparks in your shoes. I'm more than likely going to show them more with the grinder. Because one of the things is, you know, if I had to pick two really expensive things that I was going to get when I'm just starting out, it would be an arc welder and a grinder, All right? Because I, I can switch this to a cutting head, I can switch, I can cut, grind, you know, wire brushes, all that stuff with this. You can build an amazing amount of stuff with one of these little grinders, okay? And, huh? Diamond blades. Yes, stones, there's so much. Wood, metal, concrete, you name it, all right? So, this is what we'll do more of. Okay? Yes, ma'am. If you keep on the top of a grass, there's like this little wiggle. Can you make one with a little wiggle? Yes, you could. That one's actually cast aluminum on that. Where did it be? I have no idea. Oh, it broke off. Oh, it broke off. And since it's hot metal, nobody figured out how to put it back on. All right? Okay? Yes, sir. Okay, this question comes up. What do I think is the best welder to buy for a first welder? All right? And I'll tell you, I figured it out one day. The last time Carl asked that question, I was like, well, if you're going to do this, you want this, and you do that, you want that. Go get whatever welder it is you can afford to buy, buy and still buy a lot of filler metal and get you something to practice on. I don't care what kind of welder it is. Like I was telling Abby the other day, she has a welder like this one, all right? Manipulating the puddle is the same no matter what process you do. So learning to control a puddle in a horizontal position is the same with this machine as it is with my tape rig. Okay? There's a lot of differences in there. That's really oversimplifying it. But the more time you spend, the more hood time you get, the better you'll get. Okay? In fact, um, you know, you were talking about in your class, you run pads. First you learn to run beads. Then you learn to run one bead up the other against doing pads. Then you do them in the other direction, all right? And it seems incredibly tedious and boring. You can't imagine how much that will, how much that's going to teach you about welding. And I was listening to a podcast the other day. They were actually interviewing a guy. Lincoln Electric has a 10-week welding school, all right? You can go there. You'll end up with a structural certification. You're only going to stick weld, but you're going to be certified to use this to weld high-rise buildings together in 10 weeks, from nothing to this. And there was a guy that actually had the opportunity to take it twice. So he took it once right-handed, and then took it a second time left-handed. <laughs>
Right? And there are a lot of people that when they do their pipe test, they'll weld the one side right-handed and they'll weld the other side left-handed just because it's easier to prop. I will show you a way to prop to get around that prop question. One involves the file and one involves a vice grip. <laughs> okay, so that's the main thing. Now, if you're thinking about doing something, like the tombstone stick welders, you can buy them all day long used for under $200. New, they're only $300. And I have one out at the house. They're AC only. Downside is it requires a 50 amp plug. And if you only have a 100 amp service on your house, and you plug the welding machine in, and then the air conditioner kicks on while your mom's turning the dryer on, you're going to blow the main. Right? This one here only requires 110 volts and only requires a 20 amp breaker. Most garages have that. And one on the back porch, and one in the bedroom. And, you know, right? yeah. okay. The main thing with these is watch extension cords. The 12 gauge, 100 foot extension cord that you're using with your skill saw will destroy this welding machine. Right? Won't let you get 100 yards, 100 feet from the plug. And not only that, the other thing you got to watch is if you're using one of these, don't set it down in the sun. They get hot quick. And if they don't have a thermal <coughs> shut off in them, you will burn the welder up and destroy it. You will let the smoke out of the welder and until you replace the smoke generator in it, it will not work again. Right? Um, my Hobart kicks off constantly. It has a, it has a switch in it and trips it. So it really depends. And then you can get into the argument, which stick welder should I buy? Right? I can't go drive to that pipeline job with my trailblazer in the back of my Ford Ranger. By the way, I did that. I built a welding truck out of a Ford Ranger, and I'll show you pictures of it. Right? People won't even take you seriously. They won't even let you take the test. But if you're doing structural iron work, they don't care. So if I'm going to go do pipeline work, i got to have a pipeline machine. i got to have a big diesel generator, a big truck to haul it in. Because the welder itself weighs 1,500 to 1,800 pounds. Right? But let's say I'm, you know, I want to get into pipe welding. I don't want to do that. You know, you can get one of those little uh, inverter welding machines like this, put together a scratch start rig, and go do stainless stuff in like breweries, pub houses. Right? That kind of stuff. And you carry that around. You, you put one of these rigid boxes together, you put the basket on the top, carry the welding machine in the basket. And you keep the whole thing in the back of your Mini Cooper. <laughs> right? The heaviest thing you got is the argon cylinder. <laughs> right? So it really depends on what you want to do. But the main thing is, get a welder. Put it in good enough. And that's the hardest thing to do. Right? And I understand. I wish I weld at least 40 hours a week. I wish I had time to go practice this other stuff that I would like to do at the hot house. I really do. I wish I had more time to do it. When I'm in the field at the plant, like welding those nuts, right? a lot of times I tack something up and then I have a 30 minute wait on QC to come out and go, yep, it's in the right spot. Yep, it's the right piece. Go ahead and weld it. Okay? Which is a lot better than me welding the damn thing up and then realize I put it on there backwards. <laughs> <laughs> Like, uh, nope. Alright. I practice welding. I'll set weird things up. Because you can practice pipe welding without pipe. You know, you can put things in different positions. I'm trying to get him to practice all the time. And just fill out welds in three positions. Alright, so that he could go do fence work with me sometimes. Okay? Yes, ma'am. It's Joey your sign. Yes, he is. <laughs> so what? No. Question on so um yeah, it depends on where you are. Lots of people call themselves welders. Best description I heard there was an uh, there was an, an ad for a job with a with a welder a job shop there in Florence, and he said, "I'm looking for welders. Just because you ran three beads in seventh grade shop class, you are not a welder." Right? In the United States, anybody can call themselves a welder. All right. Um, there are four or five hundred. I believe the you know the, the the code book for welding tests is the size of this book, and is seven hundred dollars. Okay, and there's a lot of different tests. All right, the simplest one is to do it in the flat position. And on the podcast the other day, they were talking about the guy got called out. He wanted his guys certified, so he had to take the simplest test they could. 
three eighths plate stick test in the flat position. I'll certify you to do deadly, but you're certified. All his welders are certified. They were building 18 wheeler trailers that are going down the interstate. Think about that one for a while. Was that? Yeah. All right. Just a second. Now, like in pipeline work, you're going to work on the pipeline. Every job is going to make you take a test. Okay? They don't care what certifications you have from anywhere else. You're going to get papers with them. They will give you those papers when you leave. Somebody else may or may not take them. I could write up a set of welding specs for any of these kids in here. What a plate, two inches by three inches. We're going to weld it in the flay position. We're going to weld it with this welder. We're going to cut it in half. We're going to look at one side. We're going to break the other side. And if I think they did it right, I can issue a certification card to them that says they're certified for that weld in that position with that process, according to this piece of paper. That's perfectly legal, right? In some things like in the, in the boiler fitters union, right? In the unions, the union certifies you, and then the contractor it usually accepts those papers, right? Now they may require you to take a test regardless. They're not going to issue papers with it, but they just want to see that you can weld. Right? Um, oil field is a lot like pipeline work. In Canada, they have a certification test that's recognized across the, the country. And if you go down and take the test at this place and you certify with it, you get the B car, which allows you to do X, Y, and Z welds. It allows you to do these welds under these circumstances. And most places will just accept that card and put you to work. It may also require you to take one more test. All right? And a lot of times, that's just to, uh, to, to protect them, to prove you can still weld. All right? The last time I took a structural welding test was in January of 1989, sometime in 1989. My company still recognizes the same papers. I'm good with that. It will. Yes, sir? How far ago was that? long time ago. But parked right next to the shop we're going to weld in is my 1988 Dodge Dakota that I was driving when I took that test. 47 years ago? 47 years ago. I don't know. Do the math. You're asking the wrong person. I had a kid tell me one time, you were born in the 1900s? I have an uncle that was born in 1903 and served in the First World War in Europe. And I remember the pictures of him standing there in his uniform with his 06 Springfield, and the muzzle was right here. He's got the, the, the pant legs are rolled up, the sleeves are rolled up, and he's standing right there. And I'll bet you dollars to donuts, what he did is, he wrote 18 on the bottom of both of his shoes, he walked into the recruiter's office, he put his hand on the Bible, he put his other hand in the air and said, I swear to you, sir, I am over 18. <laughs> And he did survive to come back. Right? So. I want to see proof of that. There are so many different things that you can do in welding that's not even welding. All right? You know, whether it's inspections or selling the equipment or servicing the equipment or all, any of that stuff. All right? Oh, you want me to talk about that? Go ahead. Just real quick, I know we picked up, I have a lot of little ones, but. They'll be coming up soon for time for careers if they're interested. Eddie's been doing research and we're still doing some, and he can tell you more. But we have found a company that gives out scholarships now for welding. And we also there's also a school that if you compete and you win, they will give you a free ride to your school. So we're starting to put together as we got some interest for the, the kids that are showing interest. And I'm starting to put together kind of a score info for our older kids. Um, but for those who are interested as they're going up in the, in the field, um, and there's, they say there's over 180 schools in Texas that will. A lot of those are high schools. Um, the colleges, uh, ACC in, in, in Austin is the number one for all this year. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so if you're wanting more information on that, we are getting that together because there's a lot more interested in welding and continuing that. So something to think about. I have a 
cousin that just recently retired from Exxon Mobil Corporation. He was at their plant that is on the northeast side of the region, I believe. And for the last three years, he's been telling me, pick any trade, I'll take a hundred guys. And they pay really, really well. It's not hard to make six figures in construction. Okay? And even now that he's retired from ExxonMobil, he still would like me to go down and take a test for one of his buddies and go down there and work. I don't want to live in Houston. I don't want to have to commute back and forth every weekend or whatever. I like to stay at home. Right? And there are tons of jobs. Um, I don't know which company it is, but one of the computer companies is constantly looking for what they call orbital welders. And it's a little tiny micro thing that you're doing tape welding with under a magnifying glass. It's really kind of neat stuff. I actually know a guy that left what I do to go do that. He sits in an air-conditioned clean room all day long. I am so far to the other side of the coin on that one. It ain't even funny. All right? There are. Yeah, there, there's, and, and there's lots of ways to get free education. One of them is micro works. For those that remember the show 30 Jobs, that's actually a thing that he puts on. And they offer scholarships to any trade school. You know, if you want to learn to do a trade, they offer the education. Alright? Any questions? Anything else? That's all I've got, folks. If anybody wants to talk about welding, I'll talk about welding. I'd like to keep the four older ones for just a little bit longer if I could. Talk about a couple of things. You're going to need your computer to take notes. Hurry back. Okay.